Um, and so I was like, oh, you know what, I'm going to find out about this course and see what it is. And then the more I like kind of just did research around the course in general, the more I started to like, oh yeah, this is for me, definitely for me. And the social cohesion part, which is obviously m- mostly focusing on society was like more for me, but I always took it as a sign that maybe the first time when I tried to change it and they said that I couldn't was a no because I was going to do something completely different to what I'm doing now. And as soon as they, like, as soon as I was told about this course, I I just knew it was right for me. Hello, everyone. Hope you're doing well. Uh, You know, can't believe it. Season four already. Uh, Yes, uh, this is season four, episode one. Pick up the mic. Uh, And as you know, we we love to bring new and insightful topics every season, uh, but also we get to hear great information, great facts, and uh, great highlight, highlighting great support services uh, from our guest speakers. And uh, we've got a great guest speaker for you today. Uh, our guest speaker for today is Shanice, but in a typical fashion, I say that I don't want to bore you with the details about them. Uh, you'd probably rather hear from them themselves. So uh, Shanice, I'm going to pass over to you. Could you just please introduce yourself uh, and just tell us a bit more about you? Um, so hi, my name is Shanice and I am 22 years old. So I'm currently studying studying at Brunel University, um, Global Challenges, and I'm actually on the pathway of social cohesion. And I also work part-time at Harrods. I've just recently come to the end of my enterprise project, which is a project that I have been doing for my final year. And it basically requires me to do um to work with an organization, solve a problem that they have. And I would say before I started this project, I was still like very shy, very timid, always quiet and like stuff like that. But since doing that, I've really had to come out of my comfort zone and put forward my own ideas and start um, com- like just being putting myself out there in general. And I feel like I've just found some confidence in myself that I've grown to love along the way. Wow, that's that's great. And uh, I'm sure we'll be hearing more about your, your project later on. And we're, we're very excited yeah. to hear about that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's great to have you on because uh, last season uh, we had one of your, your lecturers, uh, Mandek, on. And she, she yeah. definitely highlighted the amazing, <laughs> amazing stuff that Global Challenges do. Uh, and we're lucky enough, but unfortunately she's not here today. Uh, but one of our one of our members of our team, Yashika, is a Global Challenges graduate as well. So, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's great to I know a lot about the, the great work that you guys do. I know especially our listeners uh, most likely have heard some of the great work that you guys do. So, yeah, we're looking forward to, to finding out a bit more about not only your project, uh, but a bit more about you as well. And essentially, you, you talked about, you know, that you study global challenges and that's great. And I guess, you know, to highlight, uh, it was highlighted in Mandex episode and the link to that will be in the description. Um, but, you know, global challenges has many different pathways. Um, mm-hmm. But I guess sort of like a two part for a first question. I know we're sort of putting you putting you in the in the on the spotlight, but essentially we want to know what motivated you to mm. study global challenges. And then I guess a bit of an add-on is what motivated you to specifically go down the social cohesion pathway? Um, so to be honest with you, so I when I first started uni, I did law. Um, and then like it got to I would say so within the first two weeks I wanted to change it because I was like oh I don't really feel like I like it or I want to do it or anything like that but I was told that it was a bit too late so I was kind of like oh yeah I'll just continue with it or whatever um but then like going a long time like I just really wasn't that much into it and I was like I really don't want to do it but I'm forcing myself to do it because I couldn't change it and stuff like that so then I think it got up to February was it March one of those and I was just like I really don't want to do it at all and I spoke to like um, a few of my flatmates at the time and they I was just telling them stuff that I like so I was like oh like I'm really into like challenges like to do with like the like people and society like um when I when I was in school I did geography and one part we focused on was like the human population but also like how um like how richer countries would stay rich because of certain things that poor countries couldn't do and then the rich countries would 
purposely put these um, poor countries at this certain stage for a certain reason so that they're always dependent upon them. But I was like to my um, geography teacher, but if maybe we like didn't have debt or didn't have this or that, then maybe we could all work together and be like on the same level. But obviously she was just like, yeah, but there's a reason why and stuff like that. So when I was telling them about this, that's when I came across this um degree in general where like he was like to me I'll go have a meeting um with Mary who's the module leader um and so I was like you know what I'm gonna find out about this course and see what it is and then the more I like kind of just did research around the course in general the more I started to like oh yeah this is for me definitely for me and the social cohesion part which is obviously mostly focusing on society was like more for me but I always took it as a sign that maybe the first time when I tried to change it and they said that I couldn't was a no because I was going to do something completely different to what I'm doing now. And as soon as they, like, as soon as I was told about this course, I, was, I just knew it was right for me straight away, basically. <laughs> no, that, that's, that, that's amazing. And it's great to see that, you know, you, you followed your passion. Uh, that's one of the things yeah. we love to, to, love to highlight on the podcast is yeah. you know always follow your passion even if it doesn't make sense to the world it's all about yeah. doing what makes you happy at the end of the day and yeah it's great to see that you know yeah. like while I was listening I was just like this is this is amazing you know you, you're going down the law route and then you're just like no this isn't this I mean isn't I was right. really hesitant at first to change it because I was like oh my god that means I'm gonna have to like do first year again or like this and that and I was like I don't even know if like my parents will be happy with me doing first year again but like I couldn't stick with something that I genuinely didn't like. And I knew going into it that I wasn't going to pursue anything with law. Like I just picked it because obviously with law, like you could get into anything basically. And I just thought it might be like the easier option. But doing that first year, I literally only enjoyed one module, which was like the criminal part of it like um but everything else I did not like and I was just like no this isn't for me <laughs> no no it's, 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 it, that's 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 the thing though it's yeah it's even like when you when you I guess you know and it's great that you highlighted that because that's one of the things that uh my, my parents especially when it came to picking yeah. uh not only like dissertation topics but also when it came to like picking what I wanted to study at uni they said yeah. the same thing of you know at the end of the day like they were just like especially when it hits third year you'll be having all these like deadlines and you've got stuff to do for your dissertation you're thinking about what's next and they were just like at the end of the day if you feel like doing a particular course you're just going to sit there and you're just going to be like you know what I genuinely don't like this they said it's rather it's better that you know at the you know as early as possible you say actually this isn't the path for me I want to do something else then you essentially like you said, like spent and like imagine if you you'd done law and then you got out of it and you're just like, I actually don't like law. Yeah, <laughs> like it's yeah. it's so true. Um, and that's and it's great, like I said, it's great to see that you, you found your passion, you're doing amazing work with global challenges, and um yeah, yeah we, we, that's that's perfect. I know you kind of touched on like what social cohesion is a bit in the previous question, but um, yeah, for this question, we were just wondering if you could expand a bit more on that because some people might be listening uh, or watching and they might not necessarily know what social cohesion is. Yeah. Um, so social cohesion is actually the ability for people to work together and incorporate to basically form a unity with each other. And this unity allows like society to basically integrate and become more interconnected. And with social cohesion, it's an important element that contributes to like many societies, whether that's in a country or like the world as a whole is peaceful and democratic and prosperous nation. And it just gives like nations a stronger bond and even like across different groups. And it just allows people to create trust in this institution of the government, basically. Yeah, that that thank you for that. And uh, yeah, that, that definitely that definitely educated me. Well, there is uh, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but it's basically how people work to get like to in simpler terms, how people work together in society to basically form a unity. Mm, that's so key. Uh, you know, it's yeah. it's all about like intersectionality, getting everyone to work, yeah. work together for a common goal is the only way we can actually really make you yeah. know lasting change. And I think that's yeah. that's great that uh, you know, 
that you're doing that course and Brunel's offering that because uh, yeah because yeah, when when you know uh, and I guess for people who may not know the episode is all about you know the importance of social cohesion so when you know you, you said you studied global challenges but the the social cohesion route I was just like I, I, I've never heard of this before I have no yeah. idea what this could be I've never heard of the term social cohesion before yeah, um, but yeah I think I think it's, Even it's great myself, never heard of it before <laughs> like first year um because when I was in school, like I was kind of torn between, I was like, oh, I would love to do geography, but the human side, but then like, what can you do with geography? Because I mean, we've, I mean, this course in general has loads of degrees in one, like it covers like um, maths. So we do like a module on stats. We cover computer science. So a module in coding, we cover, um, like we even did a bit of law in my actual course yesterday. Um, I mean, my actual class yesterday. So it's a huge, like it's got, it's very broad and it includes everything, but like the core bit of it is challenges, the challenges in that, which is more fun, I would say. Yeah, it's, no, it sounds really good. Um, and yeah, like, I think like you said, it's it's great to know like the different opportunities that are available to you after you've graduated and to know that yeah. especially you, you'll have like a wide range of uh, of options available yeah. um and yeah i think that's a, that's really great and uh that i guess nicely leads on to our next question um because obviously we've explained what social cohesion is but um how will or what roles uh does social cohesion play in addressing global issues uh, maybe for example like with climate change how can social cohesion help to address it well with social cohesion in terms of climate change um i believe that believe that if like people come together and like just kind of create trust in the system of what they're saying because there's a lot of i know even like articles and many like stories out there that like kind of say oh climate change isn't real and stuff like that or like you you might have like many like well, I know that like, journalists have to like always like give one um both sides. They can't just give one side of the story. And when it comes to like climate change, so where's the um like where do they draw the line from that? Because they can't say it's fake. But then like because I feel like so many so many people nowadays don't trust like what the government is saying or trust what journalists are saying, no one really wants to cooperate with like what is going on. So I would say in terms of social cohesion and climate change, I mean, we just have to find a way to have people working together in general. Like we need to have them promote trust um, in there, but also like have people have a sense of belonging in the community and not like be um, excluded from the community. So in, yeah, I would, say in that sense yeah but if we're talking about like let's say like conflict and war like social cohesion promotes trust and fights off social exclusion and allows people to have a sense of belonging whether that be in a community or a country so therefore ultimately by having a society that cooperates and works together we have peace and equity and that can be applicable to climate change as well yeah so it, typical, yeah. typical online uh, <laughs> trying to mute and it, it never works. Um, but no, that, that's so true. Um, you know, yeah. it's all about the, these relationships that yeah. it's not only, you know, necessarily, you know, especially when it comes to climate change, we talk about the relationships that we as individuals have with nature, but also the relationships that we have as a community or yeah. as a, as a, I guess, as one, one people. Yeah. Um, and that, that's really key because that links into to everyone's uh, favourite section, uh, Mic Check, which is back for season four, uh, where we're putting in, you know, these key, uh, you know, interesting ideas and st stats and facts that link to what we're talking about. And there's this great one from uh, this organisation, they're called uh, Healthy People. Um, and it's an organisation within America. But they did, a, they did like a, they've got a page on their website which talks about social cohesion. And it kind of highlighted some of the things that uh, you were saying there, Shanice, about, you know, the, the idea of like relationships are important for not only physical health, but, you know, yeah. our well-being as a whole. Uh, yeah. You know, we we need to think about how, I guess, essentially as a community, we can use the relationships to help better, you know, 
whether it's behavioral changes or whether it's like you said in terms of climate change you know getting a community to recycle more um, whether it's to help build trust within a community so you know we can uh, ensure that I guess if a community feels like they need to use a certain resource, they can use that as well. Um, and yeah, so it, it just the the article, um, which we'll, we'll put the link in the description, goes into like a lot of detail about, you know, where, where like the importance of like social networks and how this links to social capital. Um, and I definitely recommend that, you know, people generally do read this um, because it, it, there is a lot of interesting, yeah. you know, data here. And it is quite interesting in the, the sense of like how, this can help with like wider impact. So it's even got a bit here um, where it was saying that, you know, in uh, they did a study uh, looking at how like natural disasters um, and I guess social cohesion are linked. And they were saying that during natural disasters like heat waves, uh, yeah. elderly individuals that live in neighborhoods with low social cohesion rates may lack social support um, from concerned neighbors who will check on them. There'll be fewer communal area or safer community areas where they can seek refuge. So even, you know, plays a part in the you know i guess after or during you know mm -hmm. natural disasters it, it plays a part in the the i guess ensuring that the community is safe and the, mm -hmm. the after the work that's done afterwards to to keep the community safe as well mm -hmm. uh, and i know that through you know previous looking at previous uh, stuff through my studies uh, from undergrad that you know there's clear examples that if a community doesn't have that support network they do struggle when it comes to things like natural disasters so yeah I think definitely it is key yeah no it's definitely true it reminds me of like one um, case study that I did in school and it was in geography as well um, so it was like the Haiti case study so they're always mm. prone to like natural disasters and stuff like that and like every time they had a natural disaster like they would have like a temporary build so like I think they're more prone to like um, earth earthquakes if I'm correct I remember yeah, um yeah. and like obviously they have to build like earthquake prone like buildings and stuff like that but they don't have like the money for that so then I can't remember what country it was that was like willing to help but at like a cost so if we like provide you with this then you've got to do this on that and that's where like the whole issues around like debt has come from where I'm mm. like well like if they kind of just came in and said well we'll help you do this and we'll give you this and this then they'd have a better chance that's maybe surviving the next one where like maybe the damage won't be as bad or like more, most people won't lose their homes or have to like leave and find a new place and stuff like that yeah no that, that's so that, yeah. I completely agree with that because even um we we did a um we did uh like a case study uh, activity we had to do a whole poster competition from undergrad and well, the one that my group was looking at was the idea of uh was well was uh, hurricane katrina and the impact yeah. that it had uh, in america mm -hmm. and one of the things that um i really found interesting and i did a bit for my for my dissertation but also did for that module was looking at like the mental health aspect so yeah. it was talking about how in we, we read this uh, article uh, by the world health organization that was talking about how after natural disasters um cases of whether it's domestic violence or child neglect or child abuse uh sometimes can go up because of different different factors um so it's not necessarily like you know for a hurricane or if there's like a natural disaster, it's going to necessarily always lead to these. But it was saying that it's, there's enough that a pattern has been established. And it was really interesting because, you know, it was one of the things that I, when I remember when I was learning about it, I was saying that when you're like, I don't know, reading news articles about this, or you're seeing that the works that, be, that gets done in these communities, yeah. um, you know, you don't necessarily think about like the, the mental health impact of, of afterwards. Yeah. Um, they were even saying like uh, there was one uh, where I was looking for my for my dissertation about like how flooding impacts mental health within England. And they were saying that even like, I guess, typically we might think that especially adults uh, might be more impacted. Uh, their mental health might be more impacted. But they were saying even like young children, um, Save the Children had like a report and they were saying that young children can be m more impacted. And actually yeah. are more important to to the I guess building up a community's resilience to to flooding, yeah. for example, in the UK. Yeah. Um, because they were saying that by encouraging young people to know or to be active in the you know decision making of saying, like, hey, this is gonna be, I guess, what how as a community we're going to, you mm -hmm. know, uh, make sure that we're resilient to to flooding. You know, yeah. these are the things 
that we need to be aware of that we can do. Um, and they were saying that sh children can come up with these creative solutions of bringing everyone in the community together. Um, mm. So yeah, so it, it is, you know, these are all the examples are, are clear, clear examples essentially of like how impactful you know, mm. social cohesion can be to ensuring that yeah. there's long lasting change in a community. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and that sort of nicely leads on, I guess, uh, to to a more hopeful question. Uh, <laughs> where um, for for our next question, Shanice, we want to ask you, what's your hope for the world in regards to social cohesion? Um. Well, the ultimate goal and hope, I guess, for me is that, like, I hope that one day, like we can all work together and be interconnected and just not for the sake of benefiting like one particular group or a country um, because that's what the reality is today and that's how the world is today but I just want us to like be able to work together in general because like let's say for instance like trade agreements as an example um, so they favor they're more in favor of like the western world rather than like I don't, I don't like to say this. I know it's not a term that's used anymore, but what was seen before is like the global South. So like trade deals and aid agreements are supposed to help um, places like African countries in achieving like the sustainable development goals for like economic growth or so. Um, but it's actually the EU and the other richer countries that are in control of these deals that are being made. And they have no involvement in like the African countries have no involvement in them whatsoever, apart from like some of South Africa, um, which is like, I mean, if it's for them, why would they not have any involvement? So then in a way, like it, it's catered more towards the richer countries. It's obviously going to benefit them more, but then like, because like the Afri African countries not all of them are completely developed and like educated the way the Western world has been. They're not going to know any better when it comes to like decision making. And I also read a book for my like second year. So it's called The Divide by Jason Hickel. And he also talks about how like once upon a time, like countries like um, countries in Africa or like Asia had like the means to fully develop um, because of the resources that they have. But the Western countries chose to like invade these places because they wanted to stay at the top and have them be dependent upon them. But then obviously that's when like, oh, like you see how there's like all these conflicts now, there's this, there's that. Whereas like, if we just worked as one, like we'd have solidarity in this world. And obviously I know like, it's easier to just say that and be like, oh yeah, you know, like peace upon this world. Like we should have this, it, like we should be hopeful of this. Obviously it would take a lot to do that, but like it, it makes the world a lot more easier to live in because why should we live a certain way and have the others live another way just so that we could stay on top? Yeah, and that, I think that's one of one of the key things uh, that people say about, I guess, the, yeah. you know, the, the the new world that we're going into, uh, whether that's looking through the eyes of climate change or, like you said, um, you know, with, with essentially, you know, the pandemic. I think that's one of the people said that, you know, obviously, I'm, I'm not saying that the pandemic was great on any format, um, yeah. but they were saying one of the lessons learned was that it was essentially a shared experience that everyone in the world went through. It wasn't a case of there was, you know, yeah. one part of the world or one people um, that wasn't affected. It was something that impacted yeah. everyone's lives. Um, and I think, like you said, it's that, it's that shared belonging of, hey, you know, we're, we're all different people. We're, mm -hmm. We might come from different walks of life. We might have different income. We might be, you know, from different races. Um, but it's essentially about understanding that our, our differences are what make us unique. And we're all working towards, you know, just doing the same thing. Um, and I think, yeah, I think, like you said, it's it's one of those, those great things, uh, you know, I will highlight this, uh, that, you know, global challenges as a whole before, before the pandemic, uh, again, she's not here, but Yashika, uh, was a part of the, the trip, um, that I, I believe was to Gambia, if, if, if I'm correct. Um, that, that, yeah, 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 Gambia. Um, Zambia. Yeah. Zambia. 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 So yeah, I, first, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and 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 you know, uh, there's the, if you're a Brunel student, there's loads of pictures in the lecture center that you can see. Um, but that that was impactful work, and mm -hmm. I think that's one of the things that, um, you know, uh, my my 
like through 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 life uh, that I've always appreciated is these volunteering experiences. Uh, now I'm not saying you necessarily have to you know go travel to another country, um, yeah. but even simple things like just helping someone um, in your local area or yeah. in, you know on your course or things like that is always great. And I think, like you said, it's it's that idea of helping someone and not necessarily feeling you know, the person feeling indebted to you, like they have to give you, yeah. whether it's money or right, they have yeah. to give you your time or anything back. It's just like, you're just doing it because you know, it's the, it's a good thing. Um, and I think, yeah, that's, that's a key thing. Um, and it always, you know, I always say that it does make you feel good. I'm not saying that, you know, you should only do good, do good things because it makes you feel good. Um, but yeah, it's always nice to just, you know, see, see someone smile and, or, you know, appreciative of like the works that someone else has done, mm-hmm. um, especially when they weren't expecting it. Uh, one last thing before we go on to the, to the next, the final question, um, mm-hmm. was I know that there was this, this really nice video, um, that, that I saw on Instagram uh, a couple of days ago where this, uh, this boy, uh, who suffers from autism, um, his classmates knew that he was a big, uh, WWE fan. He loves wrestling. Um, so what they did is they just all grouped together and they bought him, bought him a belt. Uh, and then they he, so he's just walking through he's walking through the hallways uh, I think it was in America he's walking through the hallways at high school uh, and they just came up to him and they said hey um, you know we just we know you love wrestling so we we just got you this little thing and yeah the the smile that lit up his face uh, you know no, nothing can nothing can beat that so uh, yeah, yeah sure. it's one of it's, yeah no it's 100% it's just one of those things that you know true I guess true true happiness giving someone true happiness is something that you know has no financial benefit has no financial value um but it's something that as humans and as people we can all agree is just yeah. something that we all truly cherish um mm-hmm. sure. yeah. and, and you know like i said i'm sure we'll be we're looking forward to the great work that you, you're going to do um now before we go into the last official question that we're, we're going to ask you i know we haven't actually spoken about it um but your project you briefly mentioned it at the start and you know yeah. our listeners are a, a lovely and they, I'm sure they are as eager as I am to learn a bit more. So, yeah, yeah. could we know a bit more about your project, what you're doing, the organisations you're working with, things like that? Um, so the project that I'm doing, so it's with, it's actually come to an end actually now. So I'm just writing up the final report. But it's one that I got to pick um, in class. So we, so there was about, I think, five different organizations that you could pick from or different projects that you can pick from and the one that me and my partner had picked was how might we um, increase the capability and capacity of people to work together as a collective in a community Um, and when I saw that question I just thought immediately of like in terms of like careers and like how we can get young people thinking um, about their careers from a younger age rather than later on because I know that in school I mean I mean I didn't even know what I wanted to do up until the start of third year um, which was daunting for me because I was like oh my god like I'm coming towards the end of my degree I'm in my final year like what on earth am I doing now I know thank god but um, like I would have loved to have this experience like maybe like in sixth form or like maybe in like school, like towards the end of school, like year 11 or year 10 or so, but I didn't get that. And so with this project, basically what me and my partner decided to do was basically work with young people to basically help them figure out what they want to do in the future. Not necessarily because not necessarily like completely figure out what they want to do because it could change. Don't get me wrong, but like just, have them know that the skills that they learn from our workshop, which was our actual project, um, can be applicable in the real world. Whether that be in like um, law, like being a lawyer, a doctor or um, pharmacist, or anything like that. But we also wanted them to know that these are not the only um, role, career paths that they can go to. Like you can be an analyst, you could be um footballer if you wanted to be you could be like a personal trainer but just know that what you learn here you can put that into practice over there 
So we really focused on that, but we also focused on the fact that I don't know if like in school you had gotten many like careers fairs. I think I went to like maybe two or three, but every single one of them, I felt like I was just being spoken to. And it was the purpose of marketing the like um, organization or the company rather than actually saying, oh, hey, this is how I did this. This is how you get here. Um, this is what they, this is what you require. This is what you've got to put into practice. Um, if you want to be able to do this, you, I can provide you with the opportunity to shadow me as well, as well as this or this, or we can keep in contact. Like mostly they mostly say, oh yeah, it's just for networking, but it's not networking because they talk to you. <laughs> you don't really talk. You might ask them like one, two or three questions and that's it. But most of the time it's like, yeah, like our company is this, our company, our company is that. But it's never like, like, so how do you think you're going to get there? What do you think you need to do to do this? So we like catered this specific workshop for young people to basically design their own careers fair, um, like decide on what careers fair are missing in general. So we worked with two organisations. So one, which was an external one from Luton, which is called Youth Network. And they focused on helping um, young people become leaders, basically, and take ownership of their future, which was something that we really inspired us when it came to doing our project. Um, And then we also worked with the Professional Development Centre at Brunel as well, because they're all about like um, giving young people experience and prepping them, prepping them for the real world, but also actually providing them with like opportunities like for after uni, but even during uni, like internships, work experience, part-time roles and stuff like that. But many people didn't even know that they had. I only knew this because I went to a careers fair like right at the beginning and that's when I was like law isn't for me um <laughs> but then I went to another one as well so I was be- before COVID so the so in my second first year is when COVID hit basically and I was going to do an internship that summer so I was in contact with the professional development center like a lot of um a lot of the time but I only knew that because I actually like went upstairs to like where the library is I went upstairs to speak to them because I was like really confused on what I'm like basically doing with my life um but for people for some people like they're not going to have the motivation to go by themselves sometimes they need that extra push like sometimes they even know that half of the stuff that they offer that is actually there so we chose to do it with like Brunel University students but also um young people from Luton so we had them just there basically doing the workshop and it was really interactive. The fir- first two, um, the two workshops was a bit different. So the Luton one had like a more art form based kind of one where like we had them create their own zombies and give them like their own like um, characteristics. So what is like an ability that they have, a skill that they have and something that they lack that could stop them from that. So this is like basically a way for them to see whether they could improve that or what they need to do next. And the Brunel one used um, like still images to create a story about the future of what it looks like for young people. So whether you are like 16 year olds, um, 13 year olds and 10 year olds. And with that, both workshops ended with um, them creating their own careers fair. But the only difference with the Brunel one, which was with the Professional Development Centre, is that they actually all got to have like a Q&A with the Professional Development Centre where they like raised their um, any concerns, any recommendations that they had for the Professional Development Centre to market their um, themselves a lot better. Because what we found from just from that workshop, like, only one person knew about the facilities that they provide. And the one person that they knew that knew that was me. Everyone else did not know that. Um, and then even at the end, she provided them with like one-on-one um, advice that she could give. So like for like an undergraduate that is just graduating, what are they looking for in general? What do they need? What kind of help are they looking for and stuff like that? And she kind of just directed them to that, which was nice to see. But then I was like, I really would love to see this kind of work also done in like schools as well. Like even for like college and sixth form students just before they come to uni, because picking your 
degree for uni like I'm not saying that you have to like pursue a career in it and stuff like that but then like you go into a lot of debt paying for <laughs> the university so you know you want to make sure whatever you do there is worthwhile you know so yeah that was basically my project and then we just had our final like um pitch where we like presented our findings and everyone did enjoy our workshop which was really really good and I'm glad that it was very effective for them um our only critique obviously for it um you can't go obviously you can't move forward without a feedback is that we should have had more people um but because obviously COVID guidelines then we wanted to keep it really small but next time hopefully if we do host another workshop it would be with a lot more people yeah, I think a lot of people would love to attend because yeah. I think I think like like you said, like um, the 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 PDC at Brunel uh, essentially are, are one of the unsung heroes uh, that students don't really know a lot about, but they're super helpful. Yeah. Um, like we literally, uh, you know, we've got an episode out that's all about placements, uh, you know, and how how placements go. Um, and speaking to the person, and then uh, also speaking to somebody who's, who's done placements, like I completely agree that. It was only by chance that my course uh, for my undergrad focused solely on like working with the PDC to yeah. look for, for placement opportunities that I knew about them. But there were a lot of students that were just like, yeah, I have no idea. Like they were just like, oh, I need to fix my CV. And I was just like, oh yeah, you guys don't know about the PDC. Like these guys are always in my lecture, like on they a Thursday. They provided me with like a template and everything mm. for like my like CV, my cover letter and stuff like that. But like, obviously you're not gonna like, unless you know about it, or like, unless you have that, sometimes you just need that extra push to genuinely go speak to them or like find out what is. Some people just think it's it might be a bit too long to email them because they might re- not respond straight away. Or maybe they don't know where to go or where to find them. And stuff like that. But whereas if they were like marketed, I feel like a lot better then you know, maybe people might be more prone to using them um, more. Because I was genuinely, when we did that workshop, I was shocked that no one knew like about the facilities that they had offered. I was like, oh, okay. (laughs) That's, I mean, fair enough, I guess. But then like, it's just down to them. Like, are they receiving the emails that that the professional development center do send around? Um, Like, are they speaking to like careers advisors on a general basis? Have they even been introduced? to careers advisors but that's why I love this project so much because like yeah I might not have gotten like an internship or had done like work experience in the field that like I'm I would like to get into after but this project has given me something to talk about because I'm not just worked with Brunel now I've worked with like an external organization as well I've like I've had to like write up the um, business proposal for them. I've had to set up dates for the workshop. I've had to like um, set up like literally everything, do the marketing, do do this, do that, Um, which which for me at first was daunting because I was like, I don't know how on earth am I going to do this? But me and my partner that I was working with at the time, we were just like, you know what, we'll just get into it. Don't get me wrong. Like we did face some hurdles. Like um, I think that with every project, you always like face some hurdles, but it's the outcome after, like it was effective. And like, we were happy that it worked for these people because they, they, they felt like they came up with something. They didn't just come and just like take in information and just like, oh yeah, whatever. They're not going to do anything about it. They came out with something and we gave them a voice in this um, workshop. Yeah, and I think that's that's the key thing that essentially students want to have. They want to have a voice and know that their voices are being heard. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's great to see that you're already doing amazing work to, to, help, to help initiate that. <laughs> yeah. Uh- 